Welcome to We Build Great Apartment Communities, the only show dedicated to the process and strategies for transforming apartment buildings to thriving communities. I am your host, John Brackett, and welcome to the show. Hi, folks. Welcome to another great episode of We Build Great Apartment Communities, the only place where you come to learn how to take apartment buildings and turn them into amazing communities. So I have here another great guest. His name is Jeff Cook. So Jeff, kind of an interesting background. You know, he started off in this space a couple of years back, uh, built up a portfolio of about 100 units, sold them off, then transitioned more into commercial aspect, uh, assets, predominantly at this point, uh, mobile home parks. And so he has roughly about 4,500 pads, also owns about 20 commercial properties or roughly around 200,000 square feet, combination of office, retail, um, I know you didn't say industrial, but office, retail, and, uh, uh, flex. and some flex space. Yeah, some yep, flex yep. space. So, hey, Jeff, really excited to have you on. I think this is going to be a great opportunity for our listeners. Um, I think for those that are looking to start transitioning into other asset classes outside of apartment buildings, this is going to be a great segue into learning why, how, and some of the benefits and some of the challenges, right, that you've likely have been able to overcome. Uh, so. Please introduce yourself, give our audience maybe a quick summary of, you know, your background, why you got into this space, and, you know, we'll move through it. Cool. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. So it's always fun to talk about, uh, com- you know, commercial real estate. Um, so I started yeah. off, uh, like you were saying, with apartments um, in the city of Rochester, where I was born, where I'm born and raised. Got up to about 100 units and then uh, decided to sell them. Uh, fortunately, uh, right before the crash of, of 08, um, got, got lucky. Uh, sold them off and wanted to go into more commercial real estate. Uh, bought an office building and a mobile home park. The office building did so-so, and the mobile home park did did very well. So I, I lean more towards the uh, the mobile home parks. Um, and since then, we have we've accumulated um, 40, uh, 43 parks as of right now, with about forty three hundred pads. We actually have another 2,300 under contract that we should be, uh, 2,300 pads, that is, that we should be closing on in uh, next month. Um, so that we'll be up around 6,500. Um, we'll actually, we'll be the largest uh, park owner in, uh, in New York State at that point. Um, so that's what we've been focused on recently is, is the mobile home park space. Um, but like yourself, uh, you know, anything residential, I think, is a, is a great place to be these days. So. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I agree. Well, so talk to us a little bit about why the transition, right? I mean, you started off with apartments, you sold them off. Um, I'm not sure if the intent right off the bat was to go into mobile home parks or to start acquiring mobile home parks, but it sounds like you parlayed some of that capital into a park or some parks and then the other into office. So what was the logic behind the transition and, and um, you know, maybe... After you answer that, we'll talk through some of the some of the experiences along the way. Sure. So, so my apartments were primarily um, inner city apartments. Um, a lot of management, a lot of maintenance. Um, pretty pretty rough tenant crowd that we were dealing with. Um, so I, I did it for ten years, and just you know, frankly, I just I had enough. Um, they were not you know your class A or class B, more you know maybe sub subclass C, um, medium class C apartments. So like I said, you know, 10 years, I, I'd had enough and I was just ready to move on. Um, my biggest fear was going from the kind of the low, low income city housing to the low income country housing. Cause like many other people, right. I had a stereotype of what a mobile home park looked like and how it, and how it operated. And fortunately the one that I bought, the first one that I bought was, was very far from that stereotype. It was uh, built in the nineties, um, mostly double wides, mostly seniors. and was just a joy and relatively easy to, uh, to operate. Um, so that was a good transition for us. Um, you know, again, you know, I've always done very well with, with any type of residential property. Um, the, the office and the retail for us have been, um, you know, been okay. Um, but again, you know, we, we've always like providing, uh, you know, uh, residential housing to our tenants. And so, it, you know, you mentioned that you still have roughly around 2000 square feet of, of commercial space. Yep. Um, why, why did you choose to keep the, the, the 200,000 square feet of space, right? What, what was the logic behind that? It sounds like some of that stuff is performing really well, or maybe you, you wouldn't have kept it, but why do you still um, have an investment or an interest in the other product types? 
Yeah, so we like um, we like the flex space. We have about um, we have one one building or one complex of flex that's about uh, sixty thousand square feet. That's doing that's doing pretty well for us. We have a um, a forty thousand square foot um, mixed use plaza, but it's more like a mom and pop type of uh, operation. Um, um, you know, we got a restaurant, a nail salon, um, some medical office. So it's a good mix of tenants in there where we're not too concerned about having a big vacancy because our biggest space is about 5,000 square feet. We do have another um, plaza, retail plaza, um, that's about 65,000 square feet that we're actually, we are under contract to sell. And we're selling that to a large retail operator um, who's got the bandwidth and has the the relationships um, for that type of a plaza. Um, it's, it's been doing okay. You know, it's, it's six, like I said, 65,000 square feet. Um, we have, you know, we have some really good anchor tenants, um, planet fitness, um, city trends and West Marine. But again, you know, that's, it's not really, it's not for us. It's not in our, in our wheelhouse. If we have a, a vacancy there, um, you know, it's just not, again, we don't have the relationships like the buyer, um, like the, like the, uh, the entity that that's buying the property, you know, they, they had the relationships. They have sure. multiple, multiple plazas with, um, with city trends and West Marine and uh, planet fitness. So, you know, that's their game. Um, you know, our game is more the, the mobile home parks. Okay. Awesome. So Jeff, let's talk a little bit about, you know, some of the experiences that you've had along, along the way, right? So there's always this, um, this transition period, and so for, we have, we have, uh, you know, a, an, an audio space that, that looks a little bit different or maybe not, but we have a, a good portion that are season operators, of course, a portion that um, are not a season, but now looking to start, you know, expanding into other product types, kind of like what you mentioned. And then folks just looking to get into the space in many cases, looking to partner with other people, right. Or, you know, looking to, to acquire their first, you know, first asset and start and start building from there. So. Um, from your standpoint, you talked a little bit about the reasons why the transition, uh, but what have been some of the biggest lessons that you've learned along the way that you feel could help, you know, our audience maybe think through what avenue they want to go, right? Whether it be aligning themselves with someone like you, um, right, a more seasoned person, or venturing off on their own. I guess it depends on what they're doing and what their kind of their end goal is. Um, you know, we, uh, we do syndicate, you know, most of our deals and, uh, we, you know, we're always accepting, uh, investor money. We do all 506 C offerings. Um, you know, most of our investors, they don't, they don't want to be involved. They want to be passive. Um, either they have full-time jobs or they're, they're retired and they just don't want the, the headaches and the hassles. Right now, if, if you're starting off and, and you do want to, um, you know, be a large, uh, you know, or, or, you know, decent sized real estate operator. Um, and then you got, you got to start somewhere. Um, but I would start as big as possible. Um, the more units you can get under one roof um, or in one park, obviously, you know, the makes more sense and you get much better economies of scale. Um, I just, you know, it all depends if you want to be active or, or passive, um, what, what, you know, what your goals are. Yeah. And so why did you choose being an, an operator or an active <laughs> invested versus the passive one. <laughs> so I, I, I got my degree in public administration. I wanted to be a top, like a town manager or a city manager, um, you know, some type of an appointed uh, position and run, you know, run the show. Right. So I'm doing kind of similar thing, but just now with, with real estate instead of with, uh, with government. Um, I actually, I bought a single family house. Um, I was working for a market research company, uh, bought a single family home, um, had a couple of roommates, uh, that were going to help me pay the mortgage. I bought the house. It was in my name. They ba- they bailed on me. They they uh, went went home. And so at that <laughs> at that point, I didn't really want to shoulder the whole mortgage by myself because I you know I, was, I don't know early, in my early twenties I wanted to have fun you know uh, be able to go you know go out to eat drink beers and you know just enjoy myself. Right. So I moved home myself and re- I rented the house out. So that's where it all started. So it was kind of a a mistake that has worked out very, very well. Um, it's just it was one of those things. So, so I rented the house out and it was going, it went very well. It was very, uh, very simple at that point. Um, was, you know, I was making a few hundred bucks a month and paying my bills and I just started buying more houses in the city. Um, 
and it just kind of just kept moving from, you know, moving forward at, from, from that point. So yeah, build the momentum. No, I, I get that. I get yep, that. Yep. Right. So, you know, knowing where you are today uh, and when you look back to where you started, what would be, you know, the, the biggest lesson that you've learned up to this point that has allowed you to scale and to continue to grow? Uh, biggest lessons. Um, do as much as you can yourself until you can't anymore. Um, you certainly save money doing that. Um, and, and probably even more important than saving the money is you learn. Um, yeah. For me, um, you know, I did all my own along with my father. Um, I did all of my own maintenance on the city apartments and I learned a ton just about fixing things, dealing with contractors, what, you know, what exactly is involved with changing a faucet or, or um, replacing a toilet, um, replacing a light switch, just, you know, simple, uh, simple things like that, but they, you don't know until you, until you actually do it. So I think that was, that was really important. Um, and again, you know, I, I did all that stuff as much as possible until I just couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. Cause I was, you know, in, into too many things. Um, so that, that was very important. Um, and then also doing your uh, due diligence. Um, again, you know, you know, turn over every rock as, as possible. Um, look as deep as, you know, as deep as you can to really learn as much as you can about the property um, that you're buying. Um, that's, that was always very important to me. Okay, good. And I really appreciate that. Right. Because I, I do believe that as well, Jeff, I, I think uh, there's, there's so much value in starting off doing things yourself because the, all those learning lessons when you actually are hands-on in the business, I just think it makes you a better better manager, right? I mean, it's really difficult to manage assets when you don't really understand the asset yourself <laughs> or, or what's required, especially on the maintenance side. Um, a little bit different when you have in-house staff, but even then, right, very difficult to direct people or to lead people if, if you yourself are just completely unfamiliar with repairs, Yep. I mean, it, it, I, I, I've seen that go, go pretty bad. <laughs> so I, I think it's interesting that you bring that up, right? I mean, that's kind of the first thing you point to. And, and the second thing you talk about due diligence. So share a story that because of your due diligence end up working out much better than expected. Uh, because oftentimes we hear the horror stories, but there have been many instances for me where, you know, I worked through an opportunity, had something under contract. Uh, did my due diligence and found that the opportunity was much, much richer than we initially uh, were projecting because of the fact that we uncovered, you know, some, some additional opportunity. It was, it was in land value, right? What we're able to do with the land. Uh, we just had a lot more density than we thought in this case, double the density, which nice. ended up being, being uh, pretty significant. So can you share a story about why due diligence is important to, to drive that point home? So the one that comes to mind is um, I, I, not really a, a positive or a negative, just as it, was, it showed how important due diligence is. So we just closed on a, a large portfolio of mobile home parks back in the fall. And one of the, um, uh, one of the parks has a private uh, wastewater treatment system. And we, um, we did our due diligence and we found some issues with it um, that were not, that were not revealed at the time of uh, contract. We had to dig them up ourselves and we were able to get about, um, I think we're about seven or $800,000 credit um, to the, to the purchase price. Um, now, granted, we're going to use that money to um, take care of the system, of course, but I guess it's much better than being mm -hmm. on the other end of the, spectrum if, if we did not find it out and we were right. surprised right. and we didn't cl collect that money at closing so so that was that was a good thing um i can't really think of anything where we really where we've been like really surprised um we did have one park down in the binghamton area where things just didn't go as we had hoped and as we planned um re really wasn't anything that we missed as far as due diligence um it was just more of a situation um, where in this particular situation where we had contractors that we were trying to use um, and it just, it, it didn't work out. So we ended up, we ended up having to use, and it was relatively small town. So we ended up having to use our own contract, our own guys. Right. And, and then that, that park was, a, is about three and a half hours from our headquarters. So it just proved to be a little bit more difficult than we, than we had expected. Um, so, yeah. 
So I, I, I noticed in your conversation that you're, you're, you're regional, right? You're, you focus on deals predominantly in New York. That's Can you correct. talk a little bit about that? I mean, why, why the focus there? I mean, I understand it's in your own backyard, but with, with the scale that you have, why haven't you moved outside of New York and try to pursue uh, other opportunities? That's a great question. And we are, so, you know, um, we're actively pursuing opportunities right now outside of New York state, up and down uh, the East coast and the Midwest. Um, we've kind of been looking, you know, kind of half, you know, half, um, half speed here over the past couple of years, but, but this year um, we're, we're really putting the, uh, putting the pressure on to, to get some more stuff outside of New York state. Um, really, really nothing, but it's been our backyard and, and, and that's how we, we have scaled, you know, we've gradually had, um, you know, bought stuff further and further away from our, our home base here at Rochester. Um, so it was really nothing, um, planned in so, in so far as again, it's been in our backyard. So, so with, with the diminishing supply or really one and limited supply of, of mobile home parks, right? I mean, it's a pretty small community and now the diminishing supply with a lot of cities wanting to, you know, redevelop that land and make it more tax productive for, for the cities. How, what does the competition look like now? I mean, what are you experiencing now, uh, you know, with competition? I mean, you have more scale, so I'm sure you, you get a lot more looks than someone new coming into the space. But, um, you know, when you're going outside of your market and you still have to tell your story, uh, what does that look like in terms of competition? I mean, is the, are the markets getting more competitive? Um, are, they, are they relatively the same? Um, no, we're definitely, it seems like every year it gets more and more competitive. Um, you know, cap rates continue to compress. Um, yeah, it's difficult to find. That's our, our biggest problem is finding good deals, um, right. that are, that are reasonably priced. Um, equity hasn't been an issue, um, you know, over the past few years, um, but it's mostly been finding good deals. And fortunately we have good relationships with brokers and, and sellers, um, where, you know, oftentimes, like you said, we get, you know, first look, um, either ex- exclusively or with, a you know, with a few other operators. Um, we're also starting to do more development. Um, you know, like you said, it is a, it's a, it's a precarious situation with um, municipalities because they want highest and best use for their, for their land of course. Um, and their tax base. And an apartment complex is certainly going to be um, a, a much, they're going to get much higher tax revenues than they would from a, a mobile home park. But the thing that they need to balance is that the the mobile home parks are going to be much more of a of a of an affordable nature um, for the residents, um, and and they you know I mean there's certain advantages to to mobile home parks um, over apartment complexes, um, but they're also on the other side they're also the negatives. There's there's less dense, density, the homes are cheaper. Right. Um, so on those on those side, it's 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 not as good for the for the town or the village, um, but for the res the resident side, the, the owners, um, it's more advantageous. So it's a it's a balancing act for for, for municipalities. Interesting, interesting. I you know you know what's really interesting though is um, when I talk to operators in your space, I get. I get mixed reviews, right? Because on one end, the industry is small enough where you can build good relationships with private sellers. So that's kind of the offset to the diminishing supply. There we go. There you go. That's all come in. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the offset to the diminishing supply. Um, And it sounds like maybe you're experiencing the same thing. So what's the strategy moving forward, right? What is your strategy at this point? You know, you have about 4,500 pads, you're adding another 2,300. And so what is your strategy going forward, say the next, you know, two to five years? Yeah, so we want to be 20, we want to be at 20,000 pads here in the next uh, three three to four years. Um, we're looking to, um, you know, buy some larger, larger portfolios from some more um, established operators. Um, we, we, we are of the mindset that a lot of those larger operators are going to be um, quote unquote upgrading to the next, next level of, of mobile home parks. Um, you know, a lot of some, some of those operators have, have parks that they've owned for, you know, four or five years that maybe they bought them at a, you know, at a five or six cap. And now, you know, they're, they're a little higher and maybe they sell them for a four cap. Um, and for us, you know, that's, that's okay. Especially if, if there's a good scale, um, good scale to that, to that opportunity. 
Well, that, that's really surprising to hear that, you know, you're buying mobile home parks at a four cap. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there are. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. It's crazy. Um, but there's gotta be some runway for us, you know, whether that's in, in, infill or, um, or, uh, you know, raising the rents, you know, gradually over time, there are institutional money out there that'll buy four cap or even less and just hold them. Um, cause they, they know they're safe and they're stable. Um, for us, if, if we're going to buy at a four cap, we need that upside and that runway so we can get it up into the fives. So what does that look like? Then when you talk about runway and upside, what does that look like? You're buying in at a four cap. Um, how are you typically interpreting the upside to justify that type of purchase? Yeah. So it's going to, you know, it's going to be deal, you know, deal specific, of course, but if right. we have, you know, if we have a bunch of vacant lots that we can bring new homes in, um, we can add sig- a significant amount of value um, to the park by bringing those new homes in. Um, you know, rent raises, you know, we're, you know, we don't want to be aggressive or, you know, too aggressive or greedy. Um, but if we can get a, a 10% rent increase um, on, a, on a, a, a mobile home park that has, um, you know, under, under market rents, um, we're, you know, we're okay with that. And most, most residents are going to be okay with that. Um, as long as we can bring a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of love back to the park as far as some capital expenditures. Sure. So, so here's something that I, that I find a little bit interesting, right? And, and maybe you can talk through this. So one of the big advantages I see in scale is that, you know, you, you have the opportunity to raise rents marginally across a, a massive portfolio and in aggregate, it works out to be a, a pretty significant, uh, you know, addition to your NOI, right? Uh, For but- sure. For, for a mobile home park, so now you're, you know, approaching, in this case, roughly 7,000 units. What does that typically look like, right? Is it is it a $25 increase over 7,000 units per month? Is it a $50 increase over 7,000 units per month? So if if that 10% delta that you're talking about, right, is, is that usually over a one-year period? Is it a three-year period? Because I know that there's a, a, a different level of price sensitivity, um, in that market. And I don't know what the extreme is, maybe because, you know, the homes are more affordable, you have a lot more, um, you know, you have a lot more, you have a lot, you have more ability to, to raise rents, or if the price is a little bit more elastic, <laughs> where, where you just don't have that flexibility, right? But there, there has to be, I mean, you've, You've been in the business for a while, so you have to see some common, some commonalities in what you can and can't do over the course of say three, three to five years. Sure, sure. So in in New York State, we mobile home parks we're actually under rent control. Oh so, man, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So when I when I'm talking about buying stuff at a four cap, that's outside of New York State. Uh, <laughs> I was about York, to ask. Well, you're stuck. Yeah, <laughs> you're buying. Um, and you're stuck. Yeah, more or less. So, which is which is okay because you know all of our parks are at market rent, so we don't have a big issue there. Um, so right now we can raise we can raise rent three percent per year. We can go an additional three percent if we can document some ca- capital expenditures. Right. So we can go up to six percent. Um, the one thing, the one caveat there is that if we have a and that the rent control is only on existing legacy residents. So if we bring in a new home. We can we can raise that we can charge whatever we want um, that the market will absorb sure. on that uh, new home. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm more talking outside of New York State where there's no there's no rent control. And, and so, what does that look like? Was it a twenty five dollar bump? You know, roughly. Yeah. Through? So yeah, ten you know ten percent. You're going to be looking anywhere from you know twenty five to thirty five dollars a month. And and how frequently have you been able to do that? Right? Is it is that a is that usually a one time thing for every two years, three years? I know it depends on the market, but usually right. It depends on the market and and how severely under market they are. Sure. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, yeah. there's there's a lot of operators out there that are unfortunately are, are doing much higher significant rent increases, um, and they tend to get themselves in trouble by want, getting on the news for one thing or two, um, just by really, it's not, it's not, fa- I don't think it's, it's not fair. It's unethical. Um, you know, some, some groups will raise rent a hundred dollars a month. And if you're going from 300 to $400, um, for a resident that's living in a mobile home park, that's just, I mean, 
in my opinion, it's, it's just wrong. Um, it's just, it's not right. So, um, but again, if you're, if you're under market, that's the, that's the public, that's the public policy coming out in you, John. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, you know, but a 10% increase, you know, you're going from 350 to say 380 or something like that. I think most people can stomach that. So let me, let's speak to that a little bit, right? Because I, I find that a little bit fascinating and not, a, this isn't a really a conversation of, of agree or disagree, but rather it's, it's more about what the market is willing to absorb. And, you know, in the event that, that, uh, you know, you have a customer that says, Hey, look, this is no longer for me. Then, then typically they're going and, and finding another uh, place to stay or live. Right. Sure. So, sure. So from your viewpoint, what is the, what is the, you know, what is your reservation to that? Or what is the challenge with that? Because you see more than I do in that space, right? So maybe it, it, it creates other challenges that I just don't see or that our audience can't see. So if you can speak to that, that'll be great. Sure. So um, one, of the, one of the really nice things about mobile home parks and being a mobile home park investor is that the residents are very, um, we call it sticky. Um, so 98% of mobile homes, once they're sited in a mobile home park, don't move. It's just, it's too expensive to move the home. It doesn't, it doesn't make economic sense. So that's one of the good things, but also one of the negatives um, from a resident's perspective is if let's say you raise that rent a hundred dollars, most of them are, are stuck because they don't have the resources to, to either move their home um, or to, to um, go to another, um, another park because they own the home. So the, the, their largest asset is that, is that mobile home. Whereas, for example, in the apartment community, um, you can you raise your rent at the end of the lease period, and if they don't like it, they can they can move. Um, but again, with that mobile home park resident, it's it's very difficult for them to move. Okay, yeah. Now that's a great point, uh, and that's something that I that you know I wasn't aware of or really didn't even think about, right? And, yep. and so it, it's really the cost to relocate that makes it. And that makes it cost prohibitive. And now I, I get that. So that's why you're yep, saying it's yep. like it's unethical because you raise someone's rent and they really have no, they don't have the means to consider another option. And that's problematic. I, and I can see that. Yep. Yep. And, and unfortunately, a lot of operators are taking advantage, taking advantage of that. And do you see, um, you know, do you see some, do you see policy changing because of that in this space where the cities? Um, you know, are the city still leaning towards highest and best use and, you know, looking for, you know, looking for investors that can come in and, and um, find different ways to drive, you know, long-term revenues, right? Long-term tax revenue. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think in this, you know, whether it's, you know, it's the current uh, climate or, or, you know, before or after the current climate, um, you know, as you as you can see, just open the newspaper, or turn on the news. Uh, you know, affordable housing is is um, is very important these days, and, right. and there's certainly a lack of it. Um, so, you know, I think you're going to see a lot more rent control going forward because you know because of the lack of affordable housing. Um, you know, we have it in New York here, of course. Um, I think you're probably going to see it um, in Ohio. Um, Illinois has been toying with it a little bit. Um, we have it on some of the Western, the Western, uh, states already. Um, and like I said, with some of the operators taking advantage of, uh, of the situation and, and cranking rents up, you know, a hundred, a hundred dollars a month. Um, I think you're going to see more of it because it is such an affected, um, population, you know, the, the, the mobile home park residents. So they're just, they're not, you know, it's a misnomer. They're not, they're not mobile at all. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, um, I, I find that man, that, that's really interesting and really, I think extraordinarily valuable, not only from an acquisition standpoint, but from a management standpoint, right. And just a community standpoint, because um, I, I can see how that can get a little problematic and even out. Of yeah. Yep. So, so Jeff, Jeff, we're, we're approaching the end of the show. Uh, okay. I wanted to thank you for being a great guest. I mean, really enjoyed this conversation. A lot of, a lot of nuggets in here. I mean, tons of little nuggets and a lot of huge takeaways that I even walk with. In fact, I have a half a page of notes. Oh, nice. A lot of what you provided. And so I want to thank you. <laughs> it's been great. So I know Likewise. if I've been able to, to jot down, you know, a half a page of takeaways, I'm sure, you know, our audience has as well. So I want to thank great. you very much for being on. You've been a tremendous host. Um, what is the one question, Jeff, that you have for me that you think can add some value to, you know, our audience? 
One question I have for you. Um, what's, well, what's your favorite? I told you what my favorite things were about mobile home parks. What's your favorite thing about uh, multifamily? Um, you know, I, I, multifamily, I, I think, is just a, a good core core asset to own. And I think the reasons have been, have been, um, you know, uh, you know, the reasons have been shown fairly well through this cycle that we've been through yep. um, on the residential side. And so I, I like it for that reason, right? It's just a, it's a, a resilient asset class and everybody needs a place to, to occupy. But yep. I think there, there are a couple other things too that I'm seeing right now. And then I'll get into an asset class that I really, really like. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, I think with, with, and of course it depends on the market, but, you know, right now, I, I think this is happening in almost every state and maybe even accelerated right now, just because we have a lot of money in the markets. Right. And so when you have a lot of capital in the markets, I mean, and, and you have diminishing supply of product, you have more building that happens because people, start taking on more risk to generate a greater return, especially when you're chasing 4% cap rates on, you know, mobile know. home park, right? It makes sense yep. to chase a five or potentially 6% cap rate when you're building, you know, a 50 to hundred unit product in an urban area with a lot more density because there's sure. just less, less risk when you're doing that. Yep. But I, I think one of the, one of the opportunities there really is just that, right? It's, it's um, developing, um, you know, infill product in, in urban areas and just repositioning underutilized product, um, you know, for that purpose, because uh, cities, for one, to your point, right, I mean, looking to maximize revenue and, and, of, and of course, provide better service, <laughs> at least that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the city, you know, city value proposition. But yep, I, yep. I think um, the, the reality behind that is, that you don't really have a lot of opportunities to to go out in urban markets, so you really can only go up, you know? And yep. that means that most of that opportunity is going to come from repositioning existing product because usually you just don't have that available space there. So I think there's really a lot of opportunity right now um, in just thinking about deals differently and thinking about partnering with people differently to create those opportunities because they're already there. And so I think, um, you know, what I'm seeing right now and really what, how we're positioning ourselves is just finding ways to, to help people and businesses and partners um, be a resource to them in uncovering those opportunities and, and building that stuff out. Because nice. That's there, uh, but I, I, I believe that, and I'm starting to see that now, you have more and more people willing to develop the skill set to be able to make those type of presentations and add that value because the sales cycle is really, really long. Yeah, it's much yeah. longer, but when you can create those opportunities, you know, it's worth the cycle, right? Because the upside is massive. And so that, that's something that I see and I really like. Um, and it also takes a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, presentation ability and, and just tolerance for that long cycle, right? So if you, if you can't play in that space because you don't have the cash flow, then I think it creates an opportunity for people that can. So that's yep, one. Yep. The, the other thing, too, is um, uh, storage yards, man. Equipment storage. I love that space. I mean, I, I just re renegotiating a lease on on, you know, some space that I'm leasing out and, um, the markets right now are really tight, right? I mean, average, uh, average lease rates on an annual basis between seven and $9, you know, $9 a, a foot a year. And there's a limited supply of that product in this marketplace. And so when we get into these big growth cycles, like we are now, and you have all this cash and all this construction going, developers and contractors need equipment. And, um, uh, I just, I just think that's a, that's a really good play right now. Um, and so we're, you know, we're, we've been, we've been spending a lot of time there. So what is that? Like uh, big clear span buildings that you're storing heavy equipment? No, just no. industrial land and, and wrapping fence around it and putting, putting, uh, you know, you know, creating an asphalt parking lot. <laughs> Seven, nine bucks a square foot, huh? <laughs> yeah. Wow. 
<laughs> that that's okay. my mobile home park. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Yeah, and huh. so I, I'm just negotiating a lease right now. Or or uh, uh, yeah, man. I mean, um, I I couldn't even believe it. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. I know. I know. <laughs> it makes sense, and, though. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it really does. It really does. And and so I, I think that's a really unique opportunity. Um, and I think, Jeff, that we're it's just an undervalued market right now. Um, but just like everything else, you got to be a little bit careful because you know, when, when the markets turn, you just want to make sure that that you know, even though you have a lease in place, ideally with you know a credit tenant. Um, but you know, when the markets turn, uh, people don't always need all that space. So ideally, you at least have another use for it, even. Yeah. You know, even um, uh, if the market soften a little bit, right? But right. I, I think that's a I think that's a unique opportunity. Very cool. I like it. Yeah, awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate being on, and uh, you've been a tremendous guest. But I'm, I'd like to stay in touch. Yeah, if I can sure. be a resource to, to you in any way. I will, I'm happy to try. <laughs> Likewise. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate. Thank it. you so. Much. Clarity of Purpose creates our greatest competitive advantage. When we transform apartment buildings to thriving communities, we improve how people live and create assets with high profit margins. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this up with a friend. I'm John Brackett, bringing you things you can implement right away.